We're in the section on mathematical basics and um, we um, went through um, basically the singular value decomposition that is one of the tools that we will employ quite a bit in, in the course and um, <coughs> then I gave you a crash course on systems and control theory uh, the notions of stability were important as well as controllability or reachability and observability and reconstructability we introduced the gramians of the system and we'll come back to the gramians today as well in um, the section on um, realization theory let me just find it um, So I guess that's what we did yesterday um, and that's what we did, discussed. And now the next, next issue um, is um, the notion of realization of a linear system. We already probably also yesterday in the exercises used that word uh, without defining it and um, it's not much more than the set of the four matrices here are for simplicity in this section I set the E matrix in front of the X dot equal to identity as I mentioned we only treat them at the moment the case where E is invertible so you could always go to a new coordinate system by just multiplying through with E inverse and using matrices E inverse A and E inverse B instead of AB so um, that, that's not a theoretical obstacle to do that. Um, in practice you shouldn't do that, but for the theoretical derivation it's easier to get rid of the E. Anyway, so we have now, we have our system written as before as our linear autonomous set of ordinary differential equations together with the output equation. And in frequency domain we had learned yesterday that we can express the mapping from u inputs u to the outputs y via the transfer function. Um, I don't know whether I was too explicit about that yesterday. When you write that down you always implicitly assume that x0, the initial state of your system, is zero. So that it initially your system is at rest. That's a usual assumption in control theory because the state variable is usually, in, in, if, if you're really in a control setting, is the deviation from a nominal path, which at x equal to zero you assume to be zero. And only through perturbations you will develop a deviation. In other situations you have to deal with, uh, if you have to deal with non-homogeneous initial conditions you have to put in some extra work um, but I will not um, get into that here anyway, so the four matrices describing our dynamical system A, or our transfer function A, B, C and D are a re realization of the system, sigma Okay, now the question is, um, can we change the realization of a system? Or is the realization of a system something unique? And it's all, but not unique. So this is the first way to change the realization without changing the system. Change of coordinates. Yeah, you, we call a change of coordinates in this setting a state space transformation. So we replace x by tx, where t uh, is some invertible matrix. Uh, I did not write down that assumption, so um, t, of course, is non-singular. Mm -hmm. 
Um, otherwise, that wouldn't be defined. So we get four new matrices, TA, T inverse, TB, CT inverse, and D. And they describe the same system. Um, maybe just for instructional purposes, we do the calculation. We just look at the transfer function in the new coordinates. Oh. Just write down the transfer function of the system that is obtained after the state space transformation. So this is. Um, that would be the new C. C is CT inverse. Then we have S times the identity minus T A T inverse inverse um, times T times B plus D. D is not changed by the state space transformation. And now you can either pull in the T inverse and the t, or you pull out the t and the t inverse, you pull out the t to the left, that gives you an inverse that switches with this to this side, and the t inverse you pull out to the right, um, because of the matrix product inversion rule, that gives you a t on the left. Of course, if you pull out t and t inverse to the left and the right, the identity doesn't change. And you see that this cancels, this cancels, and you're left with the original transfer function again. So the transfer function doesn't change. That means the input-output mapping doesn't change. So we have the same system as before. OK, now there are many non-singular matrices, and any of them gives you a new realization. That means you have infinitely many realizations of your system. <coughs> but there's more. You can also augment your system in many ways. Here are just two. You can just add rows and columns to the system, like in this way. Um, I, I gave you only a very simple way to do it, but there are other ways. You add new states x1 of arbitrary size, say n1, could be even larger than n or whatever. You add b1 here, and then the only thing you have to observe in this situation, you add the zero here. <coughs> and if you calculate the transfer function of that system, or of that differential equation with output equation, you end up again with the same transfer function as before. Or you could do the same trick here. You can play, uh, change the roles of B and C. You add a 0 here, add a C2 there, add another A2 here, and it's still the same system. So these are also realizations of the same system as here. So it's not only that the state space transformations give you infinitely many new realizations. There are also infinitely many realizations you can, can find from augmenting your system. So you can arbitrarily increase the order of the system. OK, but the question is, can we also go down in the, in the dimension or in the order of the system? So let's uh, I'll just to say that again. So A, B, C, D, the state space transformed and the augmented realizations are all realizations of the same system. Even so, if you just look at the differential equation, you may think that this is, these are completely different things from the system theoretic perspective, from the transfer function perspective, they are all the same. Um, mathematically speaking, of course, those two are in the same equivalence class. Um, you probably can do something like that with these also, um, but that's uh, just... Um, a detour to pure mathematics I don't want to make. So the question that I just posed, is there a minimum number or a minimal order of a realization? And there is such a minimal realization. A minimal realization is a realization which has the minimum amount of differential equations in the top equation to describe still the same system and to have the same dynamic 
the same output for the same input, so the same input to output mapping, the same transfer function. And I call that number n hat, and it's called in system theory the Macmillan degree of the system. And a minimal realization now is a realization of the system of order n hat. Yeah, so there's a minimal realization, minimal number of differential equations necessary. That n hat can actually be zero for a static system. So if um, there's no dynamics, there's just a D matrix, then it's a zeroth order realization. That's a trivial case, usually not considered too often, but um, for mathematical complete completeness, um, you have to allow that case as well. All right. Um, what well, else to be said? So just going back, it's clear that also minimal realizations are not unique because if you start with a minimal realization and you do a state space transformation, it's still a minimal realization because the order of the system does not change th by the state space transformation. So you're still minimal. So minimality is good, but it's not. It doesn't give you a uniqueness. Um, these are not minimal realizations, obviously. So they are out of the game once you you're entered the regime of minimal realizations, but still you have this possibility of variations. <coughs> so the only thing that you have to choose for your system if you're in now in the class of minimal realizations is the coordinate system. So for pure mathematics um, point of view, you now say you have a unique equivalence class in which all the possible realizations e exist um, of your system. Okay, and then there's a nice characterization that we already indicated yesterday and a realization of a linear system is minimal if and only if AB is controllable and AC is observable. Yeah, so minimality can be characterized by controllability and observability and we don't have, I, maybe if you want to write that down, you will not have any pole zero cancellations anymore in a minimal system. We saw that in the example yesterday as well as in my, in my lecture as in the exercises yesterday that sometimes um, you, can, you have these pole zero cancellations and then um, you see that the order of the rational function, which is your transfer function, drops. And this is the same as going from a non-minimal to a minimal realization. Once you have all eliminated all pole zero cancellations. Okay, so this is, um, this is a theorem to keep in mind. And if, this, uh, this also implies another thing. Remember like yesterday we had um, for stable systems, systems for which the A matrix um, has all its eigenvalues in the left half plane, in the open left half plane, we could characterize controllability and observability by positive definiteness of the gradients. So there's yet another check for minimality. You can for stable systems only, you can calculate the gradients and check whether they are positive definite. And there's something more to be said about realizations, and that gives you, gets you um, closer to uniqueness um, and in, in, under additional assumptions actually it gets you to uniqueness. Um, and this is um, so-called balanced realization. I have written it down here without the assumption of stable, but it actually only really makes sense for stable systems. It has been extended to unstable systems. I will not discuss that here. Therefore, I let, left it out in the assumptions. But for us, balanced realizations, if we talk about that, we will always assume stability, A having eigenvalues on in the left half plane. So a system is balanced, or a realization of a system is balanced, or the realization is called a balanced realization, if 
the infinite controllability and observability gradients are equal and diagonal and without loss of generality we assume that the sigma j's which are on the diagonals of p and q are ordered from top uh, from largest to smallest so um, you actually get uniqueness of balance realizations if they are all different so if they are pairwise different and you have uh, inequalities here all the way through then you actually then the balance realization is unique um, if you don't if you have some of these values that are equal then there's still some freedom um, recall that for a stable system in which case um, this only makes sense to consider so far at least for us um, P and Q were positive semi-definite just by definition um, and in case of controllability P was positive definite and in case of observability Q was positive definite so in case it's a minimal system, all these numbers are positive real numbers. Now the question is, does a balanced realization always exist? And no, it does not always exist. But there is the following theorem, if we now really kick in the assumption A to be Hurwitz or stable having all its eigenvalues in the left half plane then if the system is minimal so if you have already eliminated all redundancies all pole, pole zero cancellations are gone then you can define a state space transformation I call it TB for balancing state space transformation we'll get to how it's defined so that after applying this as a state space transformation in the same way as here the system is balanced so how is this defined that's all but intuitively clear that this uh, how this where this comes from but in the afternoon in the exercises it will become very clear in just a few lines um, you take the gradients and write them, they are positive definite so you can always do that in the form S transpose S or R transpose R for instance you can use the Kolesky decompositions of P and Q then you take the Kolesky factors S and R multiply them together in the product S times R transpose and then take the singular value decomposition of that product and then you define the balancing transformation via this Kolesky factor of the observability gradient times the right singular vector matrix from this SVD and scaled by the square roots or the uh, inverses of the square roots of this singular value decomposition as I told you it's if you, on the first look it's not very intuitive why this should be so but on the other hand um, you will see um, quite easily after we have derived a new expression for our gradients um, oh, no that actually is not necessary if you just look um, at what happens to the gradients after state space transformations it becomes clear that this transformation will give you this um, this uh, particular coordinate system in which P and Q become diagonal and equal in pure mathematics this transformation that at the same time um, diagonalizes two matrices um, but not 
by a similarity transformation, then it would be simultaneous diagonalization, which is it not? Which this is not the case here, um, as we will see in a minute. Um, so this transformation is different from simultaneous diagonalization. It's called the contra gradient transformation, and it um, is a subject of um, group theory and uh, algebra, where these contra gradient transformations play a certain role. But for us, it's important that there exists such a state space transformation in which we can achieve this. OK. So the proof will be in the exercises this afternoon. OK, now that we know that we can achieve a balanced realization for a stable system, um, we know that these values here play a certain role. And um, we give them names. They are called Hankel singular values. Why they are Hankel singular values, I will explain, I think, on Thursday in the lecture when we come to balanced truncation. Um, just to, to make a note, forward note, forward reference, they are actually singular values of an infinite matrix. And this infinite matrix is the matrix representation of a so-called Hankel operator. And I will define that on Thursday. And that's why they are called Hankel singular values. <coughs> and by the way, um, it will become clear from the next slide also, these Hankel singular values um, are also the singular values that you compute here, the sigmas. Yeah. So. Um, if you do the computation for this balancing transformation, you get as a byproduct, you get these values for free. So you don't have to then <coughs> afterwards compute them. You just get them here in sigma. OK. And it's clear um, that they are all non-negative numbers, because p and q for stable systems, repeating myself, are positive semi-definite matrices. And in the minimal case, which we, uh, in which we know that the balancing transformation exists, um, if it's sufficient for this, um, they are uh, all positive numbers. And if you remember the clown and the Gatlinburg picture, which I used to illustrate how you can do dimension reduction with the SVD. Later on, and uh, this was motivated by the decay of the singular values of the matrix corresponding to the picture. Later on, we will see that we will base model reduction on the decay of these Hunkel singular values in the method that I call balanced truncation, or people call balanced truncation. And you will see that for many examples, these Hunkel singular values decay very, very fast faster than in this image processing case. OK, and the next, well, one thing I wanted to show you before we come now really to, to model, uh, to, to um, well, yet another section in the, in the basic section. But um, one thing you need to know, and it's helpful also for understanding this concept better. Um, is to say that these Hunkel singular values, they are system invariants. That means they are independent of the coordinate system in which you look. Yeah? So like the eigenvalues of a matrix or the singular values don't change with the choice of coordinate systems, the Hunkel singular values don't cha change with the choice of the coordinate system of your sp state space. So in this equivalence class of minimal realizations, um, there's no change in the Hunkel singular values. And to do that, to prove that, we prove another theorem first, which um, uh, is useful by itself, because it introduces now for the first time really matrix equations into the course, namely, that the infinite controllability and observability gradients P and Q, they satisfy the Lyapunov equations written down here. A times P plus P times N 
A transpose plus B, B transpose equal to zero. And do, in a way dual to that, the observability Lyapunov equation A transpose Q plus QA plus C transpose C equal to zero. All right. Um, these are linear systems of equations. Yeah, it's uh, linear in P, linear in Q. You can represent it in a standard way, AX equal B, if you wish. We will do that when we come to numerical methods for this, um, for this system, for these equations. Um, but it's usually not advisable to do so because you know P is a matrix. It's a square matrix. So the number of unknowns is n squared. So starting out with a finite element model with say 100,000 degrees of freedom for which solving the finite element system is something you can do nowadays easily in MATLAB. You now end up with a linear system with 100,000 square equations. So this is 10 to the 10 unknowns which is in American English 10 billions of unknowns. And then MATLAB get, gets in trouble if you try to do that. And even your uh, desktop computer might get in trouble when you try to do that. There are ways to handle that if you're in a very clever way, but there are other methods that stay in Rn and can solve this in Rn cubed if you do dense arithmetics, if you don't assume stru structure in A, and if you have structure in A, you actually get methods that work in O of n, basically, with the big constant maybe, but um, only or, or in the order of non-zeros in A, times, say, the rank of this right-hand side matrix. That, that will be the topic um, of the second half of the week. But now we just want to prove that theorem, and I think I'll do that on the blackboard. Any, uh. And I only do it for the controllability gramian. The observability gramian case is completely anal analogous. So what do we know so far? The gramian, the infinite controllability gramian is the integral from zero to infinity e to the a transpose b b transpose e to the a transpose t dt. So that's what we learned yesterday. Okay, well, how to prove that? Uh, here we use a direct approach. We just insert p in the left-hand side and we'll see that we end up, out, end up with zero. So a times p plus p times a transpose plus b b transpose is equal a times integral 0 to infinity exponential of function of a of t b b transpose and so on. You do the same with the second term. We insert the definition of p multiplied by A transpose from the right plus B B transpose. Now we see that A is independent of T so we can pull it in, into the integral. The same here. We can pull in the A transpose into the integral and the integral is linear so we can um, add the two, two integrals to one. So this is integral zero to infinity a times e to the a transpose b b transpose so this is now the integral that we get plus our constant term b b transpose so what is this
Does that any, ring any bell? A times E to the A transpose. <coughs> so if you take the first derivative of the exponential function, say E to the alpha T, what is the derivative? A. Alpha times E to the alpha T, right? So here you have the derivative of this term. And here you have the derivative of this term. And altogether it's a product rule. So this is d to the dt of e to the a transpose b plus b transpose e to the a transpose t. OK, so that's the integral over the time derivative of this expression. So this um, gives you the then just the primitive of the function evaluated at the boundary. So this is an improper integral. So we have to take the limit t to infinity. Um, well, I think I better continue here. It's the limit t to the infinity t to the a t. minus um, the integrand evaluated at 0, or the primitive evaluated at 0. So it's e to the a times 0, b, b transpose So the only thing you now need to know, we had this assumption that a is stable. That means for t to the infinity, because all the eigenvalues of a are have negative real part, the exponential decays to zero. So this goes to this is zero. E to the power zero gives you an identity matrix. The same here. And what you are left with is minus B B transpose plus B B transpose equal to zero. So we have proved um, this thing for the <coughs> controllability gradient, and um, you can convince yourself, if you like, by doing the same calculation for the observability gradient. And I hope that um, this is clear from also from the course of last week. Um, uh, and um, here you have also used that. Um, exponential function and uh, matrix A, which, which we have here, they commute, right? um, which is a property that I think Nick Hayem used quite a bit in his le lecture. OK, here's the proof again. Um, so what this was, this was an exercise to give you a relation of the Kramians to Lyapunov equations. So we have seen that there are matrix equations around. Um, but for me, for me, right now, it was just a, a lemma, a preparing lemma to prove that theorem, namely the Hunkel singular values of a stable minimal linear system are system invariants. That means they are not changed by state space transformations. And I think I wrote down the proof here um, in order to save some time. I don't do it on the blackboard. Um, what you have to prove is that if you do a state space transformation, the Hunkel singular values do not change. And for that, we first look at what happens to the Gramians under a state space transformation. And that is now easier to understand once we know that the Gramians satisfy the Lyapunov equations. So we just take any arbitrary t. Now we assume we go to a balance. Well, yeah. yeah. So just to remind you, we have balanced coordinates. Then the Hunkel singular values can be written. They are the diagonals of p and q. If I multiply them, they are squared. And then I take the square roots. So they are the square roots of the eigenvalues of the product p times q. And I will prove that this, these eigenvalues of the product p times q don't change under this, um, under state space transformations. 
So here's an arbitrary state space transformation starting from P and Q. You get a new P hat and a new Q hat, which are the, co the gramians under coordinate change. So if you look at it, the A hat is this, so you replace it, and the B hat is from the state space transformation, this expression. And then you can multiply this equation from the left with T inverse and from the right with T inverse trend or with the inverse of T transpose. So the T goes away here and here and the T transpose goes away here. So we left with the original term BB transpose and we have the A transpose here and the A and then we take brackets here to see that the relation between the original Gramian, which was P, and the new Gramian, P hat, is this. Yeah? Because, and that's something we now use, although we have not shown it, shown it, showed it so far, the solution of a Lyapunov equation under the assumption that A is stable is unique. Yeah, there's, um, it's a linear system. If you rewrite your Lyapunov equation as a linear system of equations, you can prove that if A is stable, the coefficient matrix of your linear system is non-singular. Yes, please. Uh, so, so can I have a stable LTI but um, have, an, have an eigenvalue of A on the imaginary axis? Because we, we have said it's sufficient if all the eigenvalues of A is yeah, that's, that's actually the limiting case here. I mean, as I said, I, I um, use here stable um, f to denote asymptotically stable systems because we exclude this situation. And one of the issues why we exclude it is right here. If you have eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, your Lyapunov equation does not have a unique solution anymore. Whether it has a solution or not is unclear, but if it has one, it's not unique. It's Freytom's alternative. So um, we have to exclude that case here. So if you have done a modeling with eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, you'd better rethink your modeling. Um, or what you, what in control theory, what you then usually apply first is a stabilization procedure and then go on with this. Okay, any case, um, Having said that, the solution of the Lyapunov equations are unique and as P satisfies these equations, T inverse P hat T, in, T transpose inverse must be equal to P. Solving that for P hat, you see that P hat is a congruence transformation of P. That means the eigenvalues of P hat are not the eigenvalues of P, right? So Röster's law of inertia only tells you the eigenvalues stay non-negative, but they are changed. And the same is true for Q. So Q hat is a congruence transformation of Q. The eigenvalues of Q hat are not the eigenvalues of Q. They change. Just the inertia stays the same due to Sylvester's law of inertia. But for the product P hat times Q hat, you see that Again, T transpose, T tra inverse of T transpose cancels in the middle. So what you have here is that the product of P hat Q hat is a similarity transformation of PQ. So the eigenvalues of the product P times Q do not change. And if you take the square roots, that doesn't make a conflict, right? Um, because we have positive numbers, you take positive square roots and you're fine. So the eigenvalues of the product P hat Q hat as the eigenvalues of the product P times Q are the Hunkel singular values squared. Taking square roots you come to the Hunkel singular values both of the original system A, B, C, D and the transformed system A hat, B hat, C hat, D hat. As our transformation that I used here is arbitrary, the, hun the Hunkel singular values are the same for any realization you choose. Okay, so that means they are system invariants and um, this will allow us to define approximation errors based on the Hunkel singular values. 
Yeah? Uh, no matter what realization you choose, the Hungle singular values stay the same, so you can, like in the schmidt mirsky theorem for the SVD, come up with error bounds based on these uh, Hunkel singular values later on. Okay, I think that was all I wanted to say about realizations apart from that remark. Um, what happens in the non-minimal case? We had, for the assumption that there exists a balanced realization, we used that um, uh, we used the assumption of minimality and if the system is not minimal, a, min a balanced realization doesn't, min doesn't necessarily exist. But what you can show, and that was proved in two independent, I hope at least, independent derived papers in 1987 um, by these authors, is that for non-minimal systems you can always find a quasi-balancing transformation so that the product p hat q hat comes out in this form. And n hat here is the Macmillan degree of the system. And they, so these are the Hunkel singular values of the system are n hat positive numbers plus a bunch of zeros. The individual matrices p hat and q hat in this, um, in this coordinate system look like the following. So p hat is equal sigma 1 through sigma n hat. So these are the ones that you have in front here. And then there's, oops, there's a bunch of other stuff. Maybe another positive numbers. And then zeros. And the q hat looks like, again, it has this sigma 1 through sigma n hat on the diagonal. Then it has zeros here, where we had the nc additional non-negative, uh, the additional nc positive numbers. And then you have a bunch of um, and had a bunch of non positive numbers again. <coughs> Call that number NO and another bunch of zeros. So if you multiply this, two, uh, this together, then of course you get only um, sigma 1 square until sigma n hat square and everything else cancels to zero. So for the purpose of model reduction, that will be completely sufficient. For the purpose of stating existence of a balanced transformation, it's of course clear that this is not balanced. The gradients of the system in these quasi-balanced coordinates are diagonal, but they are not equal because you have these additional numbers here. <coughs> yes? Please. Can you show that the Hunter singular values always go to 10 to 0, like theoretically? Because in practice, you see that. Well, that, that depends. Um, yes, because the Hunkel singular values are the singular values of a compact operator. So if you know functional analysis, uh, the singular values of compact operators cluster at zero. So in that sense, yes. It's even better here. You can show that, even, that if the Hunkel operator, which is an infinite dimensional object, still only has n, at most n hat um, non-zero singular values. So it's not only tending to zero, they are zero at the end, at the tail. Um, the decay, that's, a, that's a, another issue. You can construct systems where they are all one. Sigma one until sigma n hat are one. And then a method based on this will not work, obviously. But systems like that are not easy to approximate. What we have to still answer is how do we, once we have found an approximation, which will be the topic for the rest of the week, 
um, an approximation to our system. How do we measure the dis distance? How do we assess the error? And for that we need norms. All right, what are norms? Um, you probably know many norms. Um, we need now norm, particular norms for systems. And for that we first look at the transfer function again. Again, I left out the E and we have here standard transfer function. <coughs> and as I said, we want to allow Lebesgue square integrable um, input signals U and of course the L2 norm for that the signals once you went from um, time domain or state space to frequency domain that can be defined in this way. So the two norm in frequency domain is just the usual L2 integral improper from minus infinity to infinity over the imaginary axis. Um, yeah. Uh, you have to take that for the moment. <laughs> um, so instead of the, this integral on the real axis in the time domain, we take it now on the imaginary axis in frequency domain. And this 2 pi comes from this relation of frequencies to each other. Now, assuming that A is stable, again, having only eigenvalues in the left half plane, um, we can show that for any s in the closed right half plane g of s is bounded. Why is that so? First of all, on the imaginary axis we don't have any poles. And um, because of the stability... oh yeah. And because of the structure of our rational function, um, the, as I told you, the denominator polynomial, we don't have a polynomial part, that's, that's the issue here. So we don't have a polynomial part in our representation. So if you look at the imaginary axis, um, letting, so s equal to j omega is above and letting omega to infinity, you end up with d. And d, um, in the spectral norm, that's the spectral matrix norm, two induced norm, spectral norm, um, or maximum singular value, um, at infinity is the sing maximum singular value of d. So this is um, possible upper bound. It might be larger, but in any case, as we don't have poles, it's a continuous function on the imaginary axis. Um, and so it has to be bounded. Now complex analysis kicks in. And what's a, on the right half plane we, have, we don't have any poles. So G is an analytic function in the right half plane. For analytic functions we have the maximum modulus theorem that tells us that the maximum of the function is taken on, its bound, on the boundary of the region of analyticity. The region of analyticity is bounded by the imaginary axis, so the maximum of G is taken on the imaginary axis. So that bound that I have just explained why it holds on the imaginary axis must hold in the whole right half plane. Um, anyway, so now we want to see what that does to our outputs, we want to prove that our outputs now are also L2 functions. And we have two sets of L2 functions, u and y, of which g is the mapping between u and y, and if the y is also an L2 function, we can define operator norms for g. Okay, and for that we have to prove that that integral is bounded. For any u in L2, and for any stable transfer function, g, or for, the, yeah. or for that particular transfer function, g, that we are now in, have in the game. So we insert what we know, that y is equal to g times u, we insert here. And we see that this is nothing but the Euclidean norm squared integrated 
um, and the Euclidean norm squared um, is compatible, of course, with the spectral norm. So we can plug out, pull out, or we can use the submultiplicativity here. Show that this is, or use that this norm of the product is less or than or equal than the, pro no than the product of the norms of G and U. And then the norm of G is bounded by M. So we get this expression and this proves then because this is an L2 function, this integral is bounded, um, that this is less than infinity, and that means that y is an L2 function. So always now in this section, if I use norms without any index, that's um, the Euclidean vector or the spectral norm. And if we have indices at the norm, these denote system norms that I will now introduce. OK, so this is. Um, first thing. So we know that y is now in L2. The p, oops, here's again the p, that should be the q, the number of outputs. I thought I eliminated all the p's yesterday, last night, but obviously I didn't. Um, <laughs> so that p is a q again. Um, then um, now we can define the two induced operator norm and for some reason that's then called the H infinity norm so you have an infinity symbol that's intuitively not clear at the, at the moment um, but um, it's as it is <laughs> um, in the literature so if you take this induced two induced operator norm supremum of G times U divided by u, we know that this exists. This is y that we have just proved to be an L2 function. This is u which we have assumed to be an L2 function. Um, so this is well defined. And with a little bit of calculus that I don't want to go through, um, you can actually um, show that this um, two induced operator norm can actually be written as the supremum over the imaginary axis of the maximum hung, of the maximum singular value of the matrix G, evaluated at J omega. Yeah? Again, you take our rational transfer function G, which is a matrix with entries of which the entries are scalar rational functions. You evaluate all these scalar rational functions at j omega, which is a value on the imaginary axis. You get a complex number. If you've done that for all the entries, you now have a complex matrix of size q times m, which is now a constant matrix. And you take the spectral norm of that, and the spectral norm is known to be the maximum singular value of the matrix. And now you take the supremum over all locations on the imaginary axis. And that's, the, that's how you can compute it. And actually that supremum in our case becomes a max because we don't have poles on the imaginary axis. Yeah, we don't have um, singularities. Okay. Um, the, the proof um, is um, it's just sketched here. The one side is easy um, that the um, less than or equal holds here is just this line and to, to show equality you construct a particular U so that this equality holds um, and that can be done but um, I don't think that it's of any tutorial value, so I skipped the details of the proof. Um, many of the things that, um, that I don't prove can actually be found in a book by Antulas, which is a Siam book of 2005, Approxi Approximation of Dynamical Systems, it's the title. It's in the, actually in the slide set at the end in the references, so you will find that proof there also. Okay, um, so this now gives us the uh, definition of the H-infinity norm. 
H st stands for Hardy. Yeah, it's not sometimes confused with um, the H norms in finite element theory, Sobolov space norms. It's a completely different subject. Um, so it's the, we define it here now to be the supremum over all omega of the maximum singular value. Um, and here I left it to supremum because it holds for um, all functions that are analytic and bounded in C plus. Yeah, so that's, that's um, in that way you need the supremum. If we restrict the definition again to our transfer function setting, um, real rational functions which have no polynomial parts um, or only constant polynomial part at most, um, this supremum becomes a max. And the set of all the functions for which this norm is well defined, that means it's bounded, is, this, is the Hardy space H infinity. It's in the single input, single output case where M is equal to Q is equal to 1, or it's H, well, I was too tired when huh? I did that. Um, I replaced the P here. And in, case, in the matrix case, so if we have Q outputs and M inputs, our transfer function is a Q times M matrix of scalar rational functions. Um, Multi-input, that means more than one input, M equal, greater than one, more than one un output Q greater than one, we denote that space as H infinity Q times M. Okay, and um, one thing that you should know from any kind of lecture involving Fourier analysis is Parseval's equation or Parseval's identity or also sometimes called the Plancherel theorem depends on what's the main subject of your of your investigations but it tells you basically that the L2 spaces whether you're in frequency domain or in time domain whether if you've done a Fourier transform or a Laplace transform of your function they are all the same. That means um, also that the two norms in time and frequency domain coincide and this gives us the first error bound that we want. Now if we have a reduced model described by the reduced transfer function then we can and we look at the L2 norm let's do that in frequency domain first we can write it as g times u minus g hat times u and then because we just defined the h infinity norm to be the two induced operator norm suboptimality holds and we can um, get that inequality this is the h infinity norm of the difference of my two transfer functions times the original L2 norm of my input u so the, um, now that the goal would be to minimize the difference of the two transfer functions in that H infinity norm justified. And due to this, which is called in system theory Paley-Wiener theorem, this is also the two norm in time domain. So you can also define, uh, you know that if you have this bound for the two norm um, in frequency domain it's the same as the bound in the norm for time domain so once you have derived this you have a time domain and a frequency domain error bound and of course also that doesn't matter whether you take the two here to denote the L2 norm in frequency domain that means all the square integrable functions on the imaginary axis or the two norm of the square integrable functions on the real axis. And then the if you um, specialize actually um, or if you consider only functions that are square integrable on the positive real line then you have the isomorphism to the so-called Hardy space H2 which will be the next subject of our interest. But that's, that's important. Okay, now the 
Um, as I just mentioned, there's another system norm, is the H2 norm. Um, which um, first is defined via an obvious, um, well, in the obvious way, as you usually would define a two norm, <coughs> as a square, as the integral over the square of a function, or the inner product, the standard inner Euclidean inner product of the function itself. Um, now we have matrix, so the role played by the Euclidean inner product is the Frobenius inner product of two matrices. Um, and so the natural choice for a norm inside the integral is the Frobenius norm squared. And that, that gives you the definition of the H2 norm. And then again, in the single input, single output case, we call the space of all functions which have a well-defined two norm, the H2 space and or the Hardy space H2 and in the matrix valued function with M larger than one and Q larger than one, um, it's called H2 Q times M. Okay. Um, and then there's also something you can do with the H2 norm of the transfer functions. <coughs> um, if you have, again, a reduced order model, oh, I, one thing, it's clear you have to assume here that D is equal to zero. If D is not zero, then this integral is not defined because then you have um, the limit to infinity is the norm of D, the Frobenius of norm of D, which is a positive number. And if you def integrate over something that constant at infinity, you'll get infinity as the value of the integral. So you have to assume D equal to zero. You don't have to, to assume that necessarily for your reduced order model, if you only want to measure the difference of the transfer functions, if your reduced order model has the d terms equal, so d hat equals to d, in the difference they cancel out, and you can still define the h2 norm of the error, but um, that's a technical detail. So here, again, if we do the approximation by a reduced order model, we plug that in again in the L2 norm and we use a special input, namely U, U0, which is now a constant value, just the amplitude, and a Dirac impulse at zero. So um, you kick your system at initial time, zero, and then you let it go. So you don't do anything after that. U is then zero. You give it a kick. And if you just take that particular U, you can show that the L2 norm in the output is bounded by the H2 norm of the difference of the transfer functions times the amplitude of your, how hard you kicked your system. All right. And that gives you a motivation why it's also interesting to compute the H2 norm or why it's also interesting to consider approximations in the H2 norm. One issue here is that thing is hard to compute, if at all possible. But there's a very, very, very nice way to compute the H2 norm of a system. Namely, once you've given the gradient P or Q, you have this simple formula to compute the H2 norm of the system. So you don't have to do any integral calculus. You just get, solve this Lyapunov equation, take this inner product, take its trace, and you're done. So that's a doable computation. So in the, so in the e, this, is, this is actually, <coughs> basically you can do that analytically, so without error, if you would be able to compute um, the Gramian without error. That's not possible in the H infinity case. We also had a formula, but still you cannot evaluate all omegas. So if you want to do that, you have to approximate, say, by a grid on the imaginary axis and take the maximum over the grid values. There are ways to compute the H infinity norm, but these are quite complicated algorithms that I will not discuss. 
And they also give you only upper and lower bounds. So they, they can bound the, the, a, the value of the H infinity norm from top and below. And if you make that interval small enough, that's good enough. But there's no way to really get to that value exactly. In the H2 case, we have this, yeah? at least in principle, up to numerical errors. Last but not least, um, there's another formula which even is a better motivation to consider H2 norms because you can also show that the L infinity error in frequency domain, and now you don't have Parseval theorem, it's not the L infinity error in time domain, um, is bounded by the difference of the H2 norms. That These two formulas are not in your manuscripts, actually. Um, and that gives you the motivation to approximate our original model in the H2 norm. This is an approximation, or this upper line we have already seen. This gives us the um, motivation to approximate in the H infinity norm. And here are the problems again. What we now have is a rational approximation problem either in the H infinity norm or in the H2 norm. We want to approximate our transfer function, which again is a rational function um, without polynomial part or with constant polynomial part in the H infinity norm and the H2 norm. In the H infinity norm, this is an unsolved approximation theory problem. There's no way to construct the best H infinity approximate even for a rational function so far. Or at least not in a way that's accessible to computations. In balanced truncation, that's a method that we will discuss later on this week, is a way that aims at minimizing the H infinity norm and it gets usually quite close, but it's not guaranteed to give you the, give you the best approximation and usually doesn't. In the H2 norm, we have necessary conditions. There are, they, they give you local minimization conditions. Um, and it's possible to compute reduced order model, models that satisfy these um, local optimality conditions. It's no guarantee that they give you the global minimum. <coughs> Often they do, sometimes they don't. But we have at least an algorithm that goes after this H2 optimality. And we'll discuss that also later this week. And just to mention that, because you will find it quite often in the literature, there's another norm that you can define. It's the Hankel norm, which is defined just as the spectral norm of the matrix, as the maximum Hankel singular value of the system. Yeah, that's the sigma 1 from the balanced coordinates. Um, and this is not a norm in the system theoretical sense. It's only a sem semi-norm. Because if you have a constant term d, um, if you have a static system with only a constant norm d, the Hankel norm is 0, but um, the system is not a zero system. Yeah, so it's. Um, in that sense, it's only a semi-norm. And there is a way to compute the best approximation, the constructive way to compute the best Hankel approximant. It was um, a very famous work by Adamian, Arov, and Krein from Russia, published in 1971. Um, it's probably one of the most beautiful works in approximation theory couple of hundred pages of derivation if you want to go through it. So I, we, nowadays you can find it in textbooks on 10 to 20 pages. It's quite complicated and it's not easy to be used for large scale problems because the computations are quite involved and um, so far there's no algorithm that goes ar around dense linear algebra basically. So we will not discuss this, this here in the lecture because we are aiming at really large scale sparse systems that use sparsity. So we will go after these algorithms. OK, any questions regarding this? So if not, we finally, ah, one last thing, sorry. 
So if you don't want to compute norms, you can also use your eyes. Um, or you can use gridding. And that's what we usually do if we write papers. Um, we just define a grid on the imaginary axis, usually log logarithm logarithmically distributed grid, um, where we just calculate um, now, that's a little bit of trick. In the notation, I'm jumping here again. I'm sorry for that. So here again, this denotes the spectral matrix norm yeah, evaluated at this particular value. And here, that's the infinity matrix norm. So you evaluate the difference of the transfer functions at a particular given frequency omega j. And, um, and then you can do also relative norms relative errors using that and then you can just plot that. Um, over this grid and then you can take the maximum to estimate the maximum deviation. And then what's often done is you just plot um, the frequency response in the so-called Bode plot. In the Bode plot just assuming you have one single input and a single output, your transfer function is scalar, but it's still complex valued because you evaluate it on a complex number. So what you plot here is the magnitude, the absolute value of your scalar function. In here, for instance, in that example, that example we will use again tomorrow, I think, it's the transfer function of a particular example with order 348, so a quite small example. Uh, it's, it looks it's quite an interesting function. It has some peaks. And it's clear that it's not so easy to approximate. And then you plot your reduced order model, and you see that this approximation is quite good here at the very beginning. But then this approximation is not very good anymore. And then if you plot the error, between the two transfer functions, that's basically plotting um, this or this quantity. In this case, it's the same because it's scalar. Now, so this is the error between the two lines that you see here. And then on the left-hand side, if you use the Bode command in MATLAB, it's the plotted the magnitude, but not as you would think of in the usual absolute value notion, but in decibels which is um, standard in system theory. And um, decibel is 20 times log 10 of the value. So you have to interpre interpret these pictures. And if we go back to my motivating examples of yesterday, let me just see. Oops. Um, let's see. Here. These were sort of these plots, these body plots of the errors. Um, but here I didn't use the decibel range because I didn't use the body command. I just um, derived these pictures using my own function or of a postdoc's function. Um, so these are these kind of body plots. Or say with a scaling on the imaginary axis of this 20 times logarithm thing. Um, and you can see um, here that in that case the errors this would be then the peak of this would be basically the error in the H infinity norm between the transfer functions uh, so we would have an H infinity error here of 10 to the minus 2 and for the best approximation here with reduced order 70 would have an H infinity error of less than 10 to the minus 7 this is of course not a proof it's just from inspecting the graph. Um, if you really want to know, you would have to compute the age infinity norm, but for this kind of systems, it's really difficult to do, to use any of the algorithms that are around to compute the age infinity norm. So this is um, what you can, this is the interpretation of the figures that I showed yesterday. And as we now have introduced the Hunkel singular values, I just show you the Hunkel singular values of that example. Um, 270,000 was the order of the system. And you see that 
after already, say, 150, you reach machine precision. Yeah? These Hunkel singular values, this is, an this is a logarithmic scale. This is a straight line. So they decay exponentially. Yeah? And this is the best you can hope for if you want to do approximation in the H infinity norm, for instance. And this is why these figures look so good, these errors. Yeah, because this decays very fast. Anything down here, you cannot trust the computed values anymore because you're in a regime that's below machine precision. So let's go back. Now we come really to, we now know how to measure the difference between original system and reduced order system. The question is now, um, how do we construct a reduced order system? And this will be the topic for the rest of the week. And we will do um, model reduction by projection. Basically, this will be the only technique. But the way we do the projection will differ in quite great variety. Um, before we go into the two, two methods that are most of, of most interest nowadays, moment matching or interpolatory, rational interpolation and balance truncation, I just want to give you a general introduction into model reduction by projection. Okay. And as a side remark or as a before we really get into constructing a reduced order model, I just wanted to mention a few things. So this is what this is our goal that I posed at the very beginning. We want to have good approximation of the quantity of interest. And going through frequency domain, we know that we can achieve that if we have good approximation of the transfer function. This was the whole exercise that we just went through on how do we measure errors. We can measure errors if we have a good approximation in the transfer function in the H infinity or in the H2 norm. We get something like that. If we can guarantee that our approximation of the transfer function is less than the tolerance. And if you put the 2 norm here, the L2 norm here, the H infinity approximation should be smaller than um, uh, then the tolerance, or if you want to put, the, or if you have the L infinity norm, you have to have the H2 norm here. And it would be good to be able, in, in your algorithm, to, to, to get actually an expression that guarantees this tolerance. And that's not always the case for all model reduction algorithms. Um, but at least it's possible usually to derive an estimate. And then one thing that we will not focus on too much, but it's also very important. If you want to approximate a stable system, the reduced order model should be stable as well. Yeah, it's hard to imagine how to approximate stable dynamics with a system that has unstable poles. But some algorithms give you unstable poles. You cannot avoid it sometimes, so you have to do something about that. So stability is one thing. There are other things. Minimum phase is something you are interested in in control theory. Um, that means you want to have the zeros of your transfer functions also in the left half plane. That's what I explained yesterday briefly. Zeros in the right half plane are evil for control design. And in microelectronics, you deal with usually um, models of interconnect. And these are, well, they are not really devices, but if you consider them as a device, they don't produce energy. Yeah? They consume all the energy they take, and the energy that comes out might be the same as that you feed in, but, uh, and it may, might be some consumed, but it cannot increase. And this is, in mathematical terms, coined passivity. And in mathematical terms, it can be defined by this condition, the inner product, the L, well, basically the L2 product of uh, U and Y as strictly is, is non-negative. And if it's strictly passive, it's 
strictly non it's positive here. So it's greater than zero. So these are requirements that you want to preserve in your reduced order model. We will sometimes discuss this and I will at the end very briefly talk about methods that can also preserve the other two things. Okay, now for the last well, 20, 25 minutes today, we introduce projection-based methods. So what's a projector that you learned in your linear algebra course? Um, it's a matrix that is um, well, for which the square, the squaring it doesn't change it, so it's idempotent. Um, P square is equal to P, uh, not, uh, involutory. Um, and it's particularly usually associated with a particular space. So of course the range of the matrix P is V and in that setting or in that sense P is a projector onto V. That means if you have a vector in V and you apply your projector you stay in V. Uh, it's clear due to this property P squared times V um, is equal to P times V and um, V is in the range of P so you stay in the same space. On the other hand, if you have a basis of a subspace V given by the, by the vectors V1 through Vr um, and you use these vectors to define a rectangular matrix V then you can define a projector onto V by this formula. Okay. Um, and this projector is actually what is called an orthogonal projector, called, also called Gajorkin projection, um, and is defined by the property that P is symmetric. Otherwise, if P is not symmetric, it's called an oblique projector. And um, in finite element analysis, you probably heard about petrov gajorkin approximation and that um, then defines an oblique projection. We will um, come back to this. These are two different approaches in model reduction as well and we will see um, the differences later on. Um, that's of course that's just a trivial property. Um, I minus P is a projector onto the kernel of P. It's also relatively clear from the definition. Um, we call a projector a spectral projector if it's associated with a particular A invariant subspace where A is any given matrix. Um, so you have, say, a space spanned by some of the uh, some eigenvectors of a matrix, and if you want to have a projector. If you have a projector onto that particular subspace in that setting we call P a spectral projector. And an oblique projector usually needs a complementary subspace. It should have the same dimension as the, as the um, space on which we project, which is V always. Uh, where is V? Here is V. So the complementary subspace um, it's called W and it can be represented by a basis of vectors W1 through WR and then the oblique projector that projects onto V along W is this creature. Okay. And these two objects, this projector and this projector will be um, method, will be objects that we will use also now to do model reduction. And all the methods that we discuss can be interpreted as either Gajorkin or petrov gajorkin projection using either such a projector or such an oblique projector. All right, that's projector properties. And that, as I told you, all the methods that we will discuss fall into this framework. And how do we get a um, do we get a reduced order model in this setting? 
So assume we've given our subspace V and our complementary subspace W for orthogonal projection or Gayerkin projection just take W equal to V and then we approximate X by the projection onto X um, where we have made this um, compatibility condition uh, here uh, if you go back that we have um, by orthogonalized our basis for the two subspaces so this, this inner product becomes the identity that's always doable by a sort of Gram-Schmidt process um, so we have this condition so this is our oblique projector of X we call this approximation X tilde and then we call this um, vector of coordinates of our approximation in the subspace V which, you, which is X hat this, uh, this W transpose X that we call X hat so the approximation can also be written as X e is approximated by V times X hat so these are the coefficients in that expansion of the subspace V and then we get an approximation as I told you this is all the error bound that we can show in state space and it's not very useful um, because you don't have an upper bound, an easy computable upper bound for it or you have only a trivial upper bound that doesn't tell you anything um, so the difference is x minus the projection of x onto v and the reduced order model you obtain from this setting is a hat is w transpose av and this is just algebraic formulas and usually we set d hat equal to d if that's not the case I will I will point it out but that's the usual assumption okay and a nice and important property that you would expect from a petrov kajorkin approximation is that the residual of that equation um, yeah the, if you plug in your x tilde into your original dynamical system which of course x tilde is an approximation so it will not satisfy the equation so we'll have an, a residual um, that residual is orthogonal to your complementary subspace W yeah, this is easily proved um, that the claim is that this expression is zero this is our residual this is um, the basis of our subspace W, w. Um, we plug in the definition of X tilde and then we see that W transpose V that was assumed to be the identity that goes away so we have W transpose X dot the same is here uh, we have W transpose AV that's our A hat W transpose X that's again our coordinate vector in V W transpose B that's our B hat so we have X hat dot minus A hat X hat minus BU but X hat is supposed to satisfy our reduced the set of differential equations so it, it's going to be zero and that proves this ortho orthogonality condition so in that setting we are in in the same setting basically as you if you have learned about finite element theory that you would have in a um, petrov kalyakin approximation scheme our residual that we obtain by inserting the approximation into the original differential equation is orthogonal to that complementary subspace W and if it's a one-sided projection, orthogonal projection V then the residual is orthogonal to V but in general it will be a different space so this is a general property of any of the methods that we will consider now there is also a very close relation of projection to interpolation and that's exploited at many points so I want to work that out here so assume now we have our 
reduced system computed by any kind of projection method. Somebody gave you the subspaces V and W and basis for them so that you compute your reduced order model. <coughs> and then you look at the difference in the transfer functions. That's what you, that's, if you take norms now, that's what you want to minimize. So you write out these two expressions and plug in the definition of your reduced order model and then you can pull out C and B to the right because D hat is equal to D, D and D minus D hat cancels C hat is C times V so you can uh, pull out the C to the left and then you can pull out the B to the right in the same way and then we can write this also in this form um, by pulling out the S i n minus a inverse to the right. Of course, because you pull it out to the right, you have to add this S i minus a term here to the right of W transpose. So you get i n minus this matrix I call P of S. And the claim now is P of S is a projector. And Obviously, <coughs> the range <coughs> if S is not an eigenvalue of A, which we assume in implicitly, and W, of course, is a matrix of full rank, the range of P of S is V. And the claim is <coughs> P of S is a projector onto V. So if S star, uh, sorry, there's also, let's say if S, that the star is, uh, appears only once, otherwise it should be there everywhere. So if S is not an eigenvalue of A and not an eigenvalue of A hat, then P of S is a projector onto V. The range of P of S is part of the range of V, that's clear. Um, and because of this full rank condition that I just explained, which is needed here, um, that's why we have this assumption that S cannot be an eigenvalue of A or A hat, um, we have equality. So the range of P of S is equal to the range of V. So the range of P is equal to the range of the, or is equal to the subspace on which we project. The projector property is proven by showing that P square is equal to P. So we just write it down. There's the first copy of P. That's the second copy of P. What happens is that um, you can pull in the W transpose V here. W transpose times V is the identity. So you get from this identity IN to the small identity IR. And W transpose A times V is A hat. So you get this expression. That cancels with this expression. So this is going out. And then you're left with P of S. OK, so that proves P of S is a projector onto, um, onto the range of V. Now, if this is a projector onto V, if we put this creature into the subspace V, then I minus P, which is a projector onto the uh, orthogonal complement of V, will and it, uh, I cannot say that word. This product will be zero in any case. So P applied to this would not change this because this is now in the subspace. And I minus this object then uh, will vanish. So this, is, um, so this will go to zero. And that means if this is zero, then this whole expression here is zero. C times zero is zero. So the error is zero in that point S star. And that means the 
the reduced order system interpolates the transfer function in S star. That doesn't tell you anything about the error on the full imaginary axis, but it tells you that the error will be zero if you have this vector, say, if B has only one column, it's just a vector, if you pull that vector into your subspace. This would be the case, for instance, if you use a rational Krylov subspace as Marlis Hochbuch had used in her lecture on exponential integrators, probably, I guess. Is Krim here? So you, you, you saw a rational approximation and rational Krylov subspace. So you have this interpolation condition. Um, and you can play the same trick, of course, um, by pulling out this sin minus a inverse here to the left. And then you get another projector, q of s. And you can say, play the same trick. And if you have then this creature here, which is one vector if c has just one row, or which is uh, uh, q vectors if c has q rows, if you have q outputs, if you pull that, or if you take that as part of your complementary subspace, you again see that be due to this, um, uh, sorry, for due to this property here, the third property in the lemma, um, this is zero, and zero times b is zero, so again the error in the transfer function is zero and you have interpolation. So there's this connection between um, projection and interpolation. If you use vectors like this into your um, subspace, then you get interpolation. And this is already the basis of moment matching methods, Padé approximation, whatever. Um, we will um, see that later on. Um, but here's a very basic, basic um, summary of what we have just seen. If you choose your projection subspaces V and W in such a way that um, either this or this object is part of the subspace, then you have interpolation. Actually, if both hold, then you've got even Hermit interpolations so or the first derivatives of G coincide. Okay. So this is, um, yeah, this is something really you need to memorize because that will come, we will come back to this over and over again. So what else? Um, yeah, I think we have still 10 minutes. So the um, uh, first method um, that I wanted to discuss that uses the projection framework is also the most easy to compute. It's the so-called modal truncation. Modal analysis called in structural dynamics. In the introduction yesterday I told you that in structural dynamics model reduction was basically used since the 1960s and that's the method they used. So the, mo the most easy um, the most easy way to find the subspace is let's assume for simplicity that A is diagonalizable that A is diagonalizable so you can um, compute a full set of eigenvectors if you take some of them as the subspace on which you project your system. Yeah, so you take some columns of the eigenvector matrix T. Um, the choice is usually um, done by saying or by defining some of the eigenvalues to be dominant. And there are several ways to, to define such dominance measures. We will discuss them later on. But say you have selected R eigenvalues of A that are of interest. You take the eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues. You project on that subspace. 
um, you take as the complementary subspace a scaled version of the left eigenvector matrix corresponding to the say or the uh, the left eigenvectors, you take the left eigenvectors corresponding of course to the same eigenvalues you scale so that you get this condition W transpose I that W transpose V is equal to the identity you get that right by this scaling and then your reduced order model is this as a nice byproduct if you do that your reduced um, order system matrix A hat is diagonal which makes it easy to use in simulation Yeah, and um, if you look at <coughs> look at uh, if you look at the full state space transformation that you obtain from the eigen decomposition, um, you get also this block diagonal structure, which allows you um, to to derive error bounds, as we see on the next slide. This computations for that are simple. So any method that you know for large scale eigenvalue problems can be used here, like S in MATLAB, for instance. Um, which where you have uh, implicitly restarted an Aldi method behind or you can also use Jacobi Davidson methods or Lanchos algorithms whatever you like uh, whatever you want to use to solve large scale eigenvalue problems you can use here and if the system is small enough you can also use the QR algorithm if you like or the divide and conquer algorithm or whatever your choice is for the dense eigenvalue problem. Okay, what's the disadvantage here? It's the disadvantage is clearly you completely ignore in the construction of your reduced order model or in the choice of the basis on which you project or the, in the choice of the subspace on which you project you completely ignore the influence of B and C. Yeah, so the only thing that you are after here are the eigenvalues and they can give you information but maybe these eigenvalues which are, the, which are poles of your transfer function we have learned that these poles can be cancelled by zeros so if you are really in a very unlucky situation you have chosen only eigenvalues that are cancelled by pole zero cancellation if that happens, the approximation that you obtain here gives you nothing. Yeah? The error system, the error between the full and the original system is the original system. Yeah, you have a 100% error. So that, uh, that wouldn't be very helpful. That doesn't happen usually in practice. So it's, uh, the, the method works better than in the worst case, of course. So this, this um, as I already also mentioned, the Block diagonalization allows you to easily derive an error bound. In the H infinity norm, the error is given as the two norm, the spectral norm of the block C2 that you skip, the um, spectral norm of the block B2 that you discard, and one over the minimum distance of the eigenvalues to the imaginary axis. Yeah, so what you have here is, without going into the proof, basically this expression is you have the, your eigenvalues of your full order system on the, we are in the stable case again, say, and so here's the real axis, so they are somewhere here and here and here and here and now say that your model that you have selected that you have selected these three eigenvalues in your reduced order model and you're left with the other one so the minimum distance to the imaginary axis is here And this then defines you this error bound. This is um, what you have here. One over that distance is the. So the larger the distance, the better, the better the error bound. And this gives you a first dominance measure, of course. You select for the eigenvalues 
which you choose to define your projection subspace, those eigenvalues which have the smallest real part. That would minimize that bound. That's not always a good choice in practice, so we'll come to that tomorrow. It's probably no time to do that today, but that's the first way to choose the eigenvalues by minimizing, uh, by, maxim by maximizing this distance. And that's what I did here. I chose uh, for my re reduction subspace, I chose these three, which are closest to the imaginary axis. And then um, deriving the error bound is um, just doing this calculation that we did over and over again today using the block diagonal form. Then you see from that block diagonal form, you can write the error or the, uh, you can write this transfer function as the sum of two transfer functions and the first of these is the transfer function of the reduced order model and that's the transfer function of the distance between the original and the reduced order model and then you bound it in the H infinity norm that means you take the maximum singular value of that matrix and the supremum over all values on the imaginary axis um, and um, then observing that um, the maximum of all these terms is taken, is taken when omega passes by um, the eigenvalue so that j omega cancels with the imaginary part of the eigenvalue then we are only left with the real part and that maximizes this um, denominator and uh, they minimizes the denominator, maximizes the fraction, and then taking the maximum over that, that is just what I illustrated here. The maximum is taken by that of all of these values <coughs> is taken where the, for that eigenvalue that you have not in your model, which is closest to the imaginary axis, and that's what we have here. And last, the last slide for this morning, um, what I already explained is that the eigenvalues only contain limited system information. Um, the dominance measures are really difficult to compute, um, except for that one. If you have all eigenvalues computed, you're fine. But if you have, if you just think of a motor engine of a car, a finite element model of that will have 6 million degrees of freedoms, 10 million degrees of freedoms. So you would have to compute all eigenvalues. That's a formidable task. Jerry can do that, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's usually nothing you want to do. So um, you have to... Com you only, usually only compute a limited number of eigenvalues and then you apply your dominance measure. But maybe one of the eigenvalues you have not computed is important. So that's, that's a difficulty. <coughs> and then, um, as I said, you only have limited information. You don't get in the information of B and C. Tomorrow morning we will see how we can get some information about B and C into the dominance measure. 